together. So we're kind of going past that into the how is this related to judgment and how is this related to getting ready for the return of Jesus? Because the tabernacle of David really is, it's Jesus's plan for people to be ready to meet him. And that's, that's what we want to try to get into. That's the kind of been the point of the last three messages and the point of tonight. But I just want to highlight the difference. So if you're kind of looking for the, you know, real basic kind of why is it called this? What is it happening in it? There are messages out there where you can, you can plug into that. But I just feel like the Lord wants to take us a little bit deeper into how this is literally related to salvation. Okay, the tabernacle of David and salvation. So let's read Luke 17, 20 to 36. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days, in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever saves, seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Now, that sounds like if you listen to, the, especially those last couple of verses, it kind of sounds like maybe you're familiar with, like, Left Behind series and this idea of, you know, some people being raptured and some people being left. That will be the experience for many people, even though it's not describing a pre-tribulation rapture. It's describing a rapture that happens when a bunch of people don't realize they're in the middle of the tribulation. So... Pre-trib, post-trib is kind of irrelevant if you don't know what the trib looks like and you can't recognize that you're in it. It might as well be pre-trib for you if you don't recognize the tribulation, which is really the point of this passage. So if you look up, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be the days of, son of, of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they got married, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And he says, it's also like the days of Lot. Same thing in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted. So just think about all of the things this saying will operate as normal, like food distribution will be like normal. They're gonna, you're going to eat. Drink distribution, like normal. They bought, they sold. Stores will be open. Fields will get planted. Fields will get harvested. That means tractors will get made. Parts will be distributed. Fuel will be provided. Like all of these things are going to keep on happening until Jesus comes and raptures the elect. And he will leave people that thought they were, they were going after him because they weren't really letting the process designed to get them ready make them ready for his coming. And that process is called the tabernacle of David. That's literally what it is. And I'll, we've talked about this a few times, but I'll show you even tonight in the notes. The first believers, the first followers of Jesus, they believed that church was the tabernacle of David. That's, how, that's what the point of Jesus coming was to raise up the tabernacle of David. All of their writings, and I've got a few piece, passages in the notes, talk about speaking and prophesying to one another in song praying all the time, praying day and night. That was like a, a standard for Paul, a standard for Peter. He, they, they said it, I pray night and day for you. And so we have to understand that this is not some new concept separate from the gospel. This is the gospel worked out. So the Sermon on the Mount is really kind of like the, the central teaching of Jesus and how to get ready to be, to be with him forever. And that really ends with chapter seven of Matthew, where he says, if you're wise and you do these things, a storm's going to come 
and you'll be on the rock, and the storm won't wash you away. But if you're foolish and you don't do these things, a storm's going to come, and then you're going to find out your foundation is washed away. He's saying the exact same thing here, where he's saying some will be taken and some will be left. So if you don't want to be washed out in the storm, or you want to be threshed out in the shaking of all things, or you don't want to be found to be an evil servant who says, my master is delaying his coming, then what you really want to do is the Sermon on the Mount. And the practical application of the Sermon on the Mount is the tabernacle of David. The reason I say that is because Jesus says there's a narrow road in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, or Matthew 7. He says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be answered to you. And that is the narrow road in context. So if we just took that and worked it out, just logically worked it out, if I really believed that everything I needed had to be asked for and received, if I really believed the kingdom could only be received like a child, and a child can't earn anything, can't really build anything, can't really, could just ask for things, then I would spend all of my time asking, believing in faith that I would receive. The tabernacle of David is the practical application of the Sermon on the Mount. And right here, he's saying there'll be a ton of people. They will never do it. They won't connect with it. They'll think this is just life is normal. If Jesus was coming back, it'd be way different than this. But Jesus says here, the Son of Man is going to be rejected in his day, in this generation. So Jesus, the Son of Man, supernatural, God in the flesh, healing the lepers, healing the blind, people letting their you know, friends down on mats through roofs, and he's healing them. He was rejectable in his day. He was forgettable. He was debatable. He was not clear, <laughs> like to the people that didn't want him to be clear. He was debatable all the way until it was too late in that generation to say yes to him. And he said, this, for this generation will be worse than Sodom. For the people that saw all these amazing things and still debated in their minds whether or not he was the son of God. Even more so in our day, which is what he's talking about right here. It will be debatable right until the day he splits the sky. It will be normal right until the day he splits the sky. Because the kingdom is not coming in a way as to be seen. There is no measurable way outside of yourself to see the kingdom coming. The kingdom comes from within you. So people that are confident that these are the last days and that the Lord is coming, like really confident in a way that will help them, they're confident because they see an opportunity for themselves to change. And that's really what we're talking about with the tabernacle of David is an order that's coming to the earth. A government is what I mean, a kingdom that's coming to the earth, an order of living that doesn't start out here. It starts in here. And if you believe it, you do it. And then it starts to go out from where you are. Okay. And that's really, there's tons of passages in the Bible that Jesus governs this way. And we're going to, the kind of the key one that we're going to get to tonight is that in the new Jerusalem, in the, in the millennial reign, in the thousand years that Jesus is going to reign after he returns, when Jesus returns, there's going to be for decades, I think, probably hundreds of years, really, because it's a thousand year reign that he's going to enact to get the earth ready to receive his father. There's going to be many years where people will debate whether or not that's Jesus on the temple mount. There'll be a witness in the earth. They'll say, that is Jesus. There'll be people with resurrected bodies that will say, that is the son of man. Just like there were angels in Jesus's first coming that told people, this is God. I mean, angels appeared to shepherds were like, go find the baby we're telling you about. They did. And still Jesus was debatable, rejectable, dismissible, forgettable. So the same is going to be true in your day. And so there's coming this moment in time where there will be this tabernacle of David set up on the Temple Mount. And the people that are there with Jesus believing him will be the people that were believing it in faith before it was clear that this is Jesus' government coming to the earth. Are you following me? Great. Okay. So item one, the government of Jesus, it will come from within the body of Jesus. Who is the body of Jesus? Us. We are the body of Jesus. His government, it comes from within. In fact, in Isaiah, we find out that the government will rest upon his shoulder. Well, he's really clear in the Bible that he's the head, you're the body. That means the government is going to rest on part of us. Like if we're his body and the government rests on his shoulders and increases forever, like there's a lot of dignity placed on your choice to agree with Jesus about the way he runs his government in faith. 
Okay, and that mostly we just want to be like, okay, all this stuff is on Jesus. He's going to wipe his hand, you know, wave his hand, and he'll just make us all the people we're supposed to be. I just don't want to put in all the effort to figure out, is this real? Is it true? Is it worth my, my life to f- try and learn his government way? Most people don't think it's worth their lives. I think it's better to live their lives and just love him as best as they can without doing too much to mess up their lives. That's called lukewarm, and that's spit out. It's completely rejected. That's called chose, called but not chosen. So we want to be called and chosen. We actually want to spend ourselves trying to find out what Jesus wants in the earth. And he wants us to actually subdue the earth. So the flesh erroneously thinks God's government will come in a measurable or observable way. That means when I say flesh, I mean the way that you naturally think, the way you naturally feel, what you think is right, what you think is just. It's naturally bent to think God should do everything in a way that I can't be deceived without putting in any effort at all. That's, that's the arrogant nature of man is to think this should all happen in a way that I can't be tricked, but I don't have to put in any effort at all. Even though everything Jesus is doing is, a, is an emergency rescue for man that arrogantly walked away from the leadership of God through Adam and Eve and now has completely messed up God's beautiful garden. And we arrogantly think he can't, he shouldn't do anything that isn't, isn't obvious to me and requires no effort on my part to come. That's just crazy arrogant. David never looked at it that way. David did things in faith to say, who is man that you would even think of him? If you're like this towards me, what won't you give a man that's willing to seek you out, to search you out? And God's like, I will give everything to you if you're willing to put in the effort to know me. Okay. Now the government of Jesus isn't something that happens to believers. It's something that's supposed to come through them. Why? Well, because Jesus doesn't need a government on the earth. Jesus doesn't really need us. He wants us. And if we want him, then we let him do stuff through us. We don't just assume he's going to make stuff happen for us. That was the mistake of the Pharisees in Jesus' first coming. They assumed, arrogantly, that God would do whatever they thought he should do. And he was like, I'm not going to do what you think I should do. You should be, you should know me. You search the scriptures because in them you think you find life, but they point to me and you won't come to me that you could have life. We have to come to him. And that's what David did. Okay. So Jesus refuses to come apart from this internal voluntary faith. It actually takes believing something you can't see way because he's harvesting faith and patience from the earth. That's what Jesus wants from the earth. He wants faith and patience. He doesn't want rebellious people. He really doesn't. He will reject them completely. He doesn't want self-centered people. He will reject them. He doesn't want lazy people. He doesn't want uh, fearful people. He says the, the, the cowards, they're sent out of the city. He wants brave, faithful, willing to believe, and willing to seek him out people, and he will do everything for them. If you ask, you will receive. You seek, you will find. You knock, the door will be open to you. But if you won't do those things, you won't. Okay. Now, in his day, though angels heralded the supernatural virgin birth, and wise men came from far away following the star in the heavens, heralding his coming, Jesus was rejectable, unnoticeable, forgettable, and explainable to most people that met him. Most, like by far. Thousands and thousands of people followed Jesus, saw his miracles, came to John the Baptist baptism. In the end, he was left with literally 11 guys. They were all kind of walking away from him. Even after his resurrection, he appeared to 500 people. Only 120 showed up and did what he told them to do. Most because Jesus is so gentle and kind and patient. People take his gentleness, kindness, and patience for granted and find him dismissible and assume God would never let them be tricked. Although he said over and over, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived by my personality is what he's really saying. Okay, so uh, he was only seen, though, by those who were, everybody repeat after me if you want to get this. I just feel like this is important. Changing. Everybody say changing. You have to be changing if you want to see Jesus. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. So when they came to see John the Baptist, who was sent to prepare the way for Jesus, they were, he was kept telling them, I'm not even worthy to hold the man's sandals who's coming after me. And they'd say, what should we do? And he'd say, repent. Give away one of your tunics. If somebody asks you to carry something, carry it this much further. Like he was telling people how to see Jesus, how to get ready to see him. So if you're not actively, intentionally changing, If you came to God and thought, I just want to know about God, 
and had no intention that he would radically change who you are, what you thought, what you valued, then you haven't really come to God. You're making a God in your own mind who thinks like you. That God will never change you because it's not actually God. It's just you. That's what man has always worshipped is himself. All of the gods that we see, all the false gods, the Baals, they just appeal to the flesh. They appeal to what people already want. We have to be a people that want to change what we want. That's really what this is all about. Okay, so John the Baptist, he was telling people, change, tell God you want to change what you want, and then you'll see the one that I'm talking about. And some people did see Jesus. Now, those who participate, now what this, this is kind of participating in his emerging government, those who do that in faith, they'll be taken with him and is appearing because his government, it's already operating within them. And what I mean is Jesus's government is a government that's entirely based on seeing something and wanting it. That's what the seraphim in Revelation 4 are doing. So in the past, we've talked about the tabernacle of David, and we talk about how David told his you know, young people to prophesy, only sing prophetic songs. What he's telling them was learn to see something from God that you haven't seen before and then want it. Tell God you want it. This is what John the Baptist was saying. This is what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the whole point of Revelation 4 are these living creatures, the seraphim. They're covered with eyes. They're actually made to desire stuff. They see God and they cry out holy. And that spreads the government of God to other people. They start to see the same thing and they say worthy. The government of the Gentiles, it's really based on a satanic principle, which is submission. Convince cajole, make people see things your way, lie, cheat, and steal, and kill to destroy, where Jesus' is, is government is exactly the opposite. It's available to anybody who wants the truth. If you want the truth, you can get it, but you have to actually be willing to try to see it and then say you want it. What that's called is worship and prayer. We worship, we see, we put our imagination, the eyes of our heart on a God that's invisible by his Holy Spirit. We can try to imagine him with the truth of the word. We see realities about his personality, how patient he is, how kind he is, how loving he is, how merciful he is. And we can actually say to him, I want to change to be like you. And he will do that. If you found doing that when he comes, he will literally take you with him because you want his government. You like his government. But if you won't be bothered to do any of that, then he will not take you with him. He will completely reject you because you don't like the way he lives. Like that's how he lives. He lives to make continual intercession. David said, there's only one thing I want is to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire, to talk to God, to inquire in his temple. In a time of trouble, he'll take me there. That's what this is talking about. Do you want to be taken there in a time of trouble? Or are you kind of like, I'll take my chances with time of trouble. If it was really him coming, he'd let me know. He's not going to let me be tricked. I'll just keep doing my life. I don't want to miss any of my life. I don't want to mess things up for my kids. I don't want to mess things up for my wife. If that's you, then you're getting rejected. You just don't know it, okay? Um, let's read Matthew 24, 44 to 51. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant who's a, whom his master made ruler over his household to give him food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the evil servant, he doesn't go around telling people that ah, it's, it's not yet. He says it in his heart. The way you can tell he doesn't think Jesus is coming very soon is because of the way he treats other people. So if you really believe that your master is about to come, I saw this with my dad. My dad, he found out he had stage four cancer and all of a sudden everything he valued flipped. And he told me, he's like, I, I've lived my entire life wrong. I just wish I had spent more time vacationing with you guys. I wish I had spent more time listening to you. I just want to have time with you. Now I'm at the end of my life and I suddenly wish I had done everything different. When Isaiah saw God in Isaiah 6, he suddenly became aware, I'm a man of unclean lips. Like when you come to the realization of how close the, you are to meeting the Lord, you change your tune about everything around you, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. It's just mostly we take for granted that we got more time. 
If I told you for sure you're going to die tonight, like before you make it out of this building, your heart attitude about a ton of things would change. I guarantee it. If I told you you had a week to live and you had, let's say you had a couple thousand, hundred thousand dollars in the bank, you would totally change the way you saw that money. You'd totally change the way you saw the next two weeks. If, you, if I were like for sure you had two weeks to live. This is a reflection of how close you think Jesus is coming, but how much you're willing to give up of yourself. David understood this. David gave every, all of his money he gave to building a tent where Israel could worship God and learn to prophesy because David believed that his life, he said it, his life was like a vapor, like the grass for the mowing. He just had a very realistic vision of how valuable life is now without God. And so he spent himself just trying to agree with God about his government so he'd be ready for the government of God when it came to the earth. David saw heaven coming to earth, okay? And he talked about it often. You can search the Psalms and find this. So those who participate in faith with this idea of getting ready to meet Jesus, they will then disciple the nations with Jesus and all the others who decided to get ready. They're called the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11 and 12. Those people, it's a very small group of people, Few find this narrow and difficult way. It is narrow and difficult. But that small, narrow group of people, they will rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years and then forevermore. They're the bride. There's only one chance to be the bride. They'll be the family of God for forever. But there's the bride. Just like in my family, Samantha and I are married. That's a different relationship Sam and I have than to my third cousins. Do you see what I'm saying? You got one chance. There's appointed for one man to live once, to die once, and then the judgment. You're getting judged on whether or not you wanted God and you wanted to understand how his government worked, okay? So let's read Hebrews 11, 32 to 40. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. That better resurrection is the first resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains. <laughs> it's a lot to manage. Excellent. You have the chains of the staple. All right. Um, uh, imprisonment. Scourging, yes, and chains, uh, imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, I want you to look at verse 37. I just like the Holy Spirit highlight this to me. They were stoned. They were sawn into. They were tempted. What were they tempted with? The same things you're tempted with. They were tempted to give up. They were tempted to think this is a waste of time. They were tempted to think it's better to give in and go along. They were tempted to think none of this is real. They were tempted to think God doesn't hear me. I mean, Elijah, he was tempted to think he was all alone. After he, call, after he participated with God in calling down fire in front of 400 prophets of Baal, all of Israel returning to the Lord, Jezebel threatens him. He runs away and he thinks he's all alone. Like he was tempted just like you, just like me. But they kept saying, there is something worth contending for. And what they were contending for was faith to agree with the fact that there was a coming a time when they would be perfected with all the saints. Is that what you're contending for? Are you contending for a time where you're staying steady right now and doing the mundane outworking of faith by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, knowing there's coming a time where you'll be per perfected with these people? That's what he said. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So if you're like, you know, when's it going to work? I can tell you when it's going to work. It's going to work at the appearing of Jesus and when you rule and reign for a thousand years with all these other people that you read about and are inspired by that didn't quit, even though they were tempted, just like you. 
but it's very tempting to want our eyes to tell us we're on track and we're not wasting our lives. If that's what you're thinking, you are wasting your life because you think your life is for you. It's not. It's for God. And if you give your life to God, what he gives you back is way more life than you could have ever had by yourself. But it's the only way it works. It only works in faith. That's what the tabernacle of David is. It's a big drain that you put all your time, all your money, all your dreams, all your emotions into. It's like a grave. And if you'll do that, he'll resurrect you in faith. He will resurrect everything you die to. Every strength you give him down that drain, he, will, he says, not one tear. Have you ever cried that I haven't caught in my bottle? You haven't given one cup of cold water away to anybody in my name that I won't reward you forever. But do you believe it? And that's what the Tabernacle of David is really intended to be, is a place where you do this with other people that are all kind of striving and misunderstanding a lot of the same things and bumping into each other. And we can see in somebody else, have you ever noticed this, that you can see somebody else fail and like three or four weeks later, you realize you were failing in the exact same way and didn't see it. That's the point of all this. This is David wrote about it. Psalm after Psalm after Psalm. And he wrote about himself. He wrote about other people. It's a place to work out your salvation. Okay. So Hebrews 12, one to two, this is the very next passage after that. Uh, Hebrews 11 saying, God says, they won't be made perfect apart from everybody who says yes to the same reality. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and to the sin, and, I'm sorry, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what was the joy set before Jesus? Us. It was it just us kind of doing whatever we want, you know, Jen surfing, Vince making tacos. Was it was that the joy set before Jesus? No, it was actually his government. It was us going back to Genesis 128, subduing all of creation, having dominion over the earth, the fish of the sea, the worlds that were framed. It was us in the order that makes life happen forever, not us doing whatever we wanted to. Heaven is not a human utopia where we just kind of do whatever we feel like. And hey, thanks, Jesus. We blow them kisses, you know, from the clouds. It's us doing the thing that before God. Satan came and lied to man and broke all of creation and messed up God's garden. It's us doing the thing we were made to do. It's us very specifically agreeing with the way heaven operates. Now we can see that in Revelation 4, but we can also see it in the man after God's own heart, David. The way that he ruled and reigned in Israel is the throne that Jesus is going to rule and reign from. And it's a musical throne. It's based in worship. It's literally based in thousands of people king, keeping a fire on the altar going, not because God needs a beacon from earth, you know, like an airplane coming in for a landing. No, because they needed to change to get ready to meet God. That's what the fire is for. It refines us. It changes who we are. It's painful. It's real. It judges us. It, it, fire is light and heat. It refines. It shows off imperfections. It's like all of these things. That's what David was doing. And that's what he wrote about in the Psalms. So I'm giving you some basic principles. If you want to check them out, look in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 4, 5, and 6. Look in the Psalms. Look in the book of Revelation. And you will see that if you're not changing, actively changing your paradigm of values and your, the way that you carry your emotions, the way that you carry your thoughts, if you're not actively, prophetically changing, you're being rejected by God. You, you can be called and not chosen. That's the tragedy of the modern Western church is that it thinks everybody called is chosen. But Jesus is clear that's not the case. You have to be chosen in the calling, okay? So Jesus is the head. The witness or bride or wise or fruitful or the wheat, these are all synonymous terms. They all indicate changing or maturity. So witnesses... They have to have something to witness. Like they have to have a testimony to witness. The testimony means God did something in your life. You changed. A bride, bride gets ready for a wedding. She has to change. Wise, wisdom comes with experience. You have to change. Fruitful, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't see any fruit just popping up in, you know, April, popping out. There's a process where it grows and matures. Wheat, wheat is something that's fruitful. It had to get mature, grown, and then sifted out of the, the tares. So these are all synonymous terms for the body, what the Bible calls the body. That means you have to grow, you have to change, 
You have to grow up into the head, into the mind of Christ, into the way that Jesus sees government operating on the earth. He sees it different than we do, okay? So Ephesians 4, 15 to 24. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so last, week, last time we were together, we were talking about prophetic antiphony. Like this idea of the back and forth, the antiphony and learning to mutually submit and learning to flow together and two or three prophets prophesy, the rest judge. This is all to get us to learn how to cooperate together with Jesus as his body. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. That means your answers to problems, it has to be different than, than the world's. It has to be different. If your answers to the problems are the same as the world's, you are literally deceiving yourself, thinking that you're part of Jesus' kingdom, but you're not. In the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, uh, which grows corrupt according to this deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. How do you put on the new man? Anybody know? Ask. Yeah. Can you, can you just ask? Uh, can I ask him for new sneakers and have that become the new man? What do I have to ask for? Change, you have to ask him to change you. Vince is right. Change me into what? A new creation? Him. Yes. We have to become one with him. He's the head. So we actually have to ask him. You guys are all right. We have to ask him to change us to be like him. How do we know what he's like? You have to see him. Yeah, you have to look at him. Some people see him with their eyes. Like every once in a while we hear a testimony. I, you know, I had a dream. I saw Jesus. He told me this. But we can all see him with the eyes of our heart. This is what 2 Corinthians 3 uh, 2 Corinthians 3, the whole thing is about, is that when you get the Holy Spirit, the veil is taken away, but you have to actually use some of your faculties. You have an imagination. You actually have to use your imagination to try and see Jesus. And then when he shows you things that you weren't already thinking, in faith, you look in the Bible and you're like, is that what it says about him? And then if it is, in faith, you believe it and you hold it loosely, ready to be corrected or honed or matured. You, you have to always be ready to be matured in what you think God is saying. And the way that that happens is you get around other people that are trying to do the exact same thing. And they're like, I see this and I saw it here. And the reason that it's true is because of this. And somebody else says, yeah, that's true. And also this. And over time, I mean, this is really the body of work that we, you know, as the church, the things that we understand about the Bible came from this process that I'm describing. There's four Gospels for a reason. If you just read one of the Gospels without the other three, you will get a distorted picture of what happened with Jesus's ministry. Some people try to tip, pick apart the Gospels and they're like, they're incongruent. They don't agree with each other, but that's not true. They agree with each other. They're from different perspectives and they're for different purposes. There's four seraphim circling the throne. It's important that you hear all of this. You know, there's a reason God made the seraphim with a different faces. There's cherubim for each. They have four faces. There's all kinds of activity of seeing and declaring who God is that increases the government of God forever. This is what David was doing. That's why he appointed people, student and teacher, shifts. Like tw There were 24 different teams that took turns. There were four different worship leaders, like four seraphim in 1 Chronicles 25. He was literally trying to lead Israel to see God, and he, it worked because that's where the Psalms came from. And the Psalms are the most prophetic recordings of what was happening in Israel before the Holy Spirit was released by Jesus after his resurrection. The Psalms are literally the most prophetic thing you're going to find next to the prophets, or including the prophets, and what came out of the New Testament from the release of the Holy Spirit. The Psalms were pointing to Jesus in a way nothing had before that. David literally got Israel to see Jesus just by asking. There, were, there are many messianic Psalms, okay? 
prophecies about, about the coming Christ. Okay, so we must grow, we must change. We have to grow up into the head, just like we just read about, and that we have to put on this new man. That's what the tabernacle of David is really for. So Christianity, or what it means to be a Christian, it's not changing an eternal location. It's not what happens when you become a Christian. Tons of people are sold that lie, that, you know, just get the fire insurance. Say you believe in Jesus, you, don't, you believe he died on the cross for your sins, you're good to go. He died on the cross for tons of people's sins that aren't good to go. He died on the cross for tons of people's sins that believe he died on the cross for their sins, but they won't do anything to agree with his leadership. They are not good to go. You have to actually agree with his leadership. You have to find out who he is, what he likes, what he wants, what he's thinking, and then ask him to change you so that you could get along with him forever because he's not going to make you get along with him. He's not going to make you agree with him. He's not going to make you marry him. He's not going to make you be in his family. Okay? So this, is, this only happens. This Christianity, what it really is, is changing an internal process. Heaven's coming to earth. If you read the Bible, you find out in Revelation 20 and 21 and 22, we're not going away to heaven. Heaven's coming to earth. He's getting earth ready to receive his father again. God likes the earth. He made the earth and he said it's very good. And he liked it like it was kind of a random mess. And then he spoke some things into being and then it was ready to be cultivated. And then he put man in. He's like, well, you and I are going to cultivate this earth together. That's called government. That's why everything out here is a mess because man and God are not cultivating the earth together. It's growing all weird because man's trying to do it without God. But God is actually looking for anybody willing to be like, okay, God, the way we're cultivating it, it's not working very good. I'm gonna, it's worth it to put my time and my money down that, in that grave and see you resurrected. David did this, and he radically changed Israel. Israel was a mess under Saul. Saul was trying to cultivate Israel in his own strength. And he made a complete mess of it politically, economically, militarily, like they were getting invaded all the time. David started to do this to try and see God, and the economy literally changed. By the time Solomon became king, David's son, it says that stones were as common as silver under Saul. That silver was as common as gold. That cedars were as common as sycamore, were as common as sycamores. Sycamores were a cheap tree. Cedars were an expensive tree. He literally changed the vegetation. He changed the economy. He changed the peace. It says that by the change the go ahead. Changed the geology. <laughs> he changed everything by not changing anything, by, by enthroning God on the praises of Israel. That's literally what will help Kalamazoo. If you want to know what will help Kalamazoo endure what's coming, because there's massive judgment coming to the earth. We have broken this place in a massive way. Many people will try to fix what we broke, and it will get way worse, because the reason the earth is broken is because of a lack of partnership in prayer and humility with God fixing it. It's, it's designed to work a certain way, and we're like two-year-old kids just like reaching into the microwave and pulling out wires thinking we're fixing it. You can't fix it that way. You actually have to know how it works, okay? I never did that. I did take my mom's watch apart once, though, and thought I could fix it for her, even though I broke it. Okay, now heaven is coming to earth. For everyone not changing more as that occurs, they'll be rejected by heaven. That's the point of all of the breaking. All the judgment is to get us to humble ourselves and repent, to change. If we just harden our hearts, we're like, everybody else is breaking it for me, then we are being washed out of an opportunity to live with God forever. But if we're willing to say, no, I have to change. This is about me changing. Then God's like, I will take you and I will leave people that don't want to change. I will take you and I'll bring you into the tabernacle of David in the new Jerusalem. Okay. Now this changing, it only happens one way. There's not a bunch of ways to change. There's only one way to change. You cannot change yourself. Your righteousness is filthy rags according to the Bible. If you try to be a good person, you are literally an evil person. You can't be a good person. You're dust without God. So we have to humble ourselves and say, God, you got to change me. But that's not a one-time prayer. That's a life. That's like a, a life's ambition is to get ready to meet Jesus, to be pure and spotless. If you do that practically, there's only one way that works out. You spend your time praying with other people that are trying to change too. That's the only way it works. And that's really what the tabernacle of David is. So let's read Hebrews 10, 19 to 29. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Now, why would it say that you have to have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus? 
Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You actually, you actually have to stir yourself up and say, I know it looks crazy. I'm going to do it. What else am I going to do? What else are you going to do with your time? What else is there to do? But is get as close to him as you possibly can in the movie screen of your mind and with, with a bunch of other willing people. Like, it's weird, but you got willing people that are willing to do it. Like, it takes some boldness. It takes being a little bit un, unafraid of what people will think about you. That's what, that's what that boldness is. To just say, I'm, I'm going in. Let us draw near, right? Yep. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Why would you waver? Why would you waver, Angie? Intimidating. Do you have an enemy that doesn't want you there? Does the enemy ever lie to you? This is all a waste. You're a fool. You look like an idiot. Nobody's ever going to believe in Jesus this way. Yeah, there's all kinds of reasons we would waver. But, but the writer of Hebrews is like, don't waver. Like, remember, Hebrews 11, they were all tempted in the same way you are. But they refused to give in to the fear of man. They refused to give in to people thinking they were silly, wasting their time, ruining their families. They were even, some of them were even in prison. They were like, we'll let you out if you deny this man and the way that he operates his government. They were like, no, I'd rather, I'd rather suffer with him. I'd rather learn the fellowship of his suffering. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we live in the moment where it's kind of actually clear. I think right now we're in a contraction where it's like a little bit acute. There's something happening in the earth. And this should be a moment where it's easy in the flesh to be like, we got to get together, like, Jesus is coming back, but really what's happening is a ton of the church is disbanding. I'm like, we're not meeting together anymore. We don't, I don't want to be with people anymore. I've had enough of the church. I feel it. I don't know about you, but we all have this pull on our flesh. It's not worth it. People aren't worth it. Nobody's going to change. This is it. You know, I'll just take my chances with Jesus. And he, he's like, don't do that. Get together. Work this out together. It's difficult. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Now, this, all of this statement is about people who are saved, who have already received Jesus' payment for their sins. That's why he says, if you sin willfully after that, you rejected your one chance to be saved. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without, the mercy, without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, what the writer of Hebrews is really describing is the tabernacle of David. It's, he's describing this place where you go into the holiest of holies in your in your mind, in your faith, boldly, not wavering because it looks silly. And with other people who are willing to, stirring up each other to love and good works, getting sanctified is what that means. Like seeing things in heaven, declaring them, hearing other people see things, declare them, and together not give up because it's difficult, because prophecy is difficult. This is what Paul's describing in 1 Corinthians 12 through 15. He says, you know, the spirit is given, it's diversity of gifts, Stay in it together. Like love is the point. You could speak with the tongue of men and angels, but without love, you're just making noise. You could give your body to be burned. You could give away all your wealth, but without love, without learning how to cooperate with other people who are prophetically trying to get clean too, then it's all just a waste. You're just wasting the, the giving of the spirit to you. So the, the difficulty and the cooperation and the prophetic movement all of the writers in the New Testament, they had this vision of the tabernacle of David in mind. This was their, their idea of gathering was only gathering for one purpose. There's only one reason to do church. And it's not to like to be the prelude to Sunday lunch. That's not the reason to do church. Okay. So the body of Christ gathers to be changed. Everybody say changed by the spirit of prophecy. That's why we do church. That's why David did the tabernacle of David so that Israel could be changed, so he could be changed, so his sons, his, his military guy's kids could be changed. Why would David want everybody around him to get changed? 
Anybody have a guess? It's in the notes, but we're not quite there yet. Why would David have all these people and be like, you guys all need to change? Because he did, and God sent him really difficult people in the wilderness. He had 400 people come to him. They were like in trouble for being in debt. They were discontent. They were kicked out of their family. Like he had a bunch of trouble people. He's like, we have to change, guys. So he set up a way for people to change. Have you ever felt like you got to change? You ever felt like people around you got to change? We do. We need to change. The only way we're going to change is by gazing at who the perfect one is and telling him, I want to be like you. And if we do that, he's like, I'm faithful to change you. But it's not just you I care about. I care about all the other people that need to change too. So he's going to gather together a bunch of people that believe they need to change. That's probably going to be some difficult people. If they believe they need to change, they probably really do. I don't know about you. I'm a difficult person. I need to change. There's some things about me that have to change if I'm going to live with Jesus forever. There are some things about you that they have to change if you're going to live with him forever. And he, in his miraculous mercy, he brought you together with other people that believe this and actually spend time and money trying to do it. You're, you've been given so much. I've been given so much. You know, you don't want to waste it. Okay. Um, so. The only reason for the church is to change. The first disciples understood this change to mean the tabernacle of David. In Acts 15, we've read it a couple times, but it's worth reading again tonight. This was a big argument that all the disciples were having. So the first 40 years or so of the church, it was mostly Jewish people. And then Peter, he had this vision. And in the vision, the Lord gave him this, showed him this sheet come down from heaven. And this guy named Cornelius had called from Peter, went. And this guy that wasn't a Jewish person got saved, like became a Jewish person and believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they thought when somebody got saved into the relationship with Jesus, they were becoming Jewish. And so there was a big division as all these people didn't have a manual written out for them. They were just like, okay, everybody's becoming Jewish suddenly because of Jesus. What do we do with them? Like, do we make them do the old Jewish law that never worked for us? Or can they just ignore all the rules and live footloose and fancy free, just saying they think they hear the Holy Spirit? And they came to an agreement in this meeting in Acts 15. And the agreement was this. The guy named James stood up and he's like, look, guys. We all know this is about the tabernacle of David. And they gave some basic rules to new Gentile believers. Okay, so I want you to read Acts 15, 15 to 18. And with, and with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it, as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. So the point is, those first believers, the ones you, that wrote the New Testament that you read and you take his gospel and you should, they all believe that this process of changing Gentiles into being people ready to meet Jesus was about the tabernacle of David. That's what, they, that's what they wrote. That's what they said. That's what they believed. It's really clear in the Bible, actually. Singing to each other in songs, hymns, spiritual songs, praying for one another, contending for one another, getting the Holy Spirit, doing what those first believers had done in the upper room in Acts 2, that Joel 2 prayer meeting. You know, they were waiting for power to change. That's what they were waiting for. They were waiting in repentance for power to change in Acts 2. Why did they need to change? Well, because Jesus told them, you're going to prophesy. And they didn't really prophesy that good. Jesus told them, you're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to get healed. And they're like, we don't really do that. <laughs> and they're like, you do it. But when we try, like the demon doesn't come out. You said prayer and fasting. He told them, you're going to be generous. You're, going to sh you're not going to have to worry about money. Don't worry about the languages. And they're like, we don't know any of the languages. We're, we're, you know, we're greedy. We want power. We think the wrong things. And he's like, don't try to do any of this until you get the promise of the Father from an eye, the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they got that promise, they started to change. They were suddenly prophetic. They were laying hands on the sick and they're getting healed. They're sharing all things in common. They're being selfless. They have vision. They're prophesying. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to change. We don't do most of these things, not in the way that the Bible describes them. We should, we should literally be here 24-7. God, we don't heal anybody. We're barely healing anyone. We're barely prophesying. We are not that generous. We are pretty selfish. Our whole society is breaking down. What will it take to get us into the place of peace? And God says, I will shake everything that can be shaken. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. And in this place, I will give peace in the temple, in the tabernacle of David, in the place where people change. Yeah. Yes. And I just think also through the arc of especially in Acts, you can see that the disciples themselves, even after they changed, 
they changed. They still needed a change. And Absolutely. They still had to be like Paul had to call the other guys to account yes. and Paul had to forgive people who'd wronged him. You know, like yeah. it was all a process of changing and it was all that whole time. Yes. And it was all prophetic in the sense that the Holy Spirit was inspiring all these writings. So we're all reading about these things that are Holy Spirit inspired. God breathed, you know, this is infallible scripture because their interaction with each other was prophetic. It was spirit led. Like they were doing this. They really cared about this. And it wasn't just one location. They were literally setting up centers to pray day and night and get the spirit of prophecy and revival was breaking out. It really was. So David, he had a very clear understanding of the purpose of gathering sanctification and falling away. Let's read Psalm 26, one to 12. A Psalm of David and declare me innocent. O Lord, for I have acted with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Put me on trial, Lord, and cross-examine me. Attest my motives in my heart, for I am always aware of your unfailing love, and I have lived according to your truth. I do not spend time with liars or go along with hypocrites. I hate the gatherings of those who do evil, and I refuse to join in with the wicked. Now ask yourself, how could he possibly say this in truth? I don't spend time with liars or go along with hypocrites. Doesn't that mean he had to have some interaction with people? He's like, wait a second, you're lying! Or he lived with them for a while. He's like, hey, you're a hypocrite, right? He spoke the truth in love. He's prophetically gathered with people and spoke the truth in love and people separated from him. If you want to read the account of it, he wrote an account of it in Psalm 69. If you're taking notes, right, Psalm 69. He literally told the whole story. He's like, I love God. So I'm doing these things to get close to God and people get mad at me. They can't stand me. I'm a reproach of my friends and people I go to church with. And then it goes into this whole account of how Jesus shared in the same suffering as David. And David was sharing in the suffering of the Messiah. It was prophetically foretelling Jesus on the cross in Psalm 69. Yeah, they wanted to kill him. Absolutely. It's a church fight. People want to kill you. It's a, it's a real church fight. Yeah. I wash my hands to declare my innocence. I come to your altar, O Lord, singing a song of thanksgiving and telling of all your wonders. He's literally describing the tabernacle. He's singing a song, prophetically telling of the wonders. Like this is, if you, once you see this, you can't unsee it. The whole Bible is telling about this. Why is he talking about singing when people are hating him and refusing to join? He's like, because that's why they hate me. Because I'm doing this. I'm prophetically getting information from heaven and the earth does not want heaven's government to take over. Whether you realize it or not, your flesh does not want Jesus to come and your flesh doesn't want to live in heaven. And that's bad news for your flesh. Your flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You have to be, you have to die to your flesh and become spirit. Like you really do. And then he'll give you a new flesh. I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. Don't let me suffer the fate of sinners. Don't condemn me along with murderers. Their hands are dirty with evil schemes, and they constantly take bribes. But I am not like that. I live with integrity, so redeem me and show me mercy. Now I stand on solid ground, and I will publicly praise the Lord. Now this is the tragedy of the night and day prayer movement of our day, and the tragedy of the tabernacle in David's day, and the tragedy of the rebuilding in Ezra's day, and the tragedy of the night and day worship movement that was happening with Nehemiah's day, is there are people who will come, they will sing prophetic songs, they will worship Jesus. They won't want to change. They'll backbite. They'll slander. They'll gossip. They fight. They jockey for position. They just want to increase themselves. And they think because they're doing stuff that they think God wants them to do, they're okay. And he's like, David's like, this only works one way. It's an internal process change. If you don't come here wanting to change, you're not really coming here. You're just in the, the washing. God's using you to wash everybody else, but he's going to spit you out. He really will. That's the parable of the 10 bridesmaids. Five wise, five foolish. If you don't want to change, you will not make it. Guaranteed. It's clear in the Bible. So you have to be a person that wants to change your leadership structure. You must. So sanctification or change was not private in David's mind or in his tabernacle. These are public things. And we just read about that right there. It was a government reality prophetically singing with those who wanted to change, which means to subdue creation. So what man was made for was to take kind of a tangled mess of stuff alive and growing and to prune it and to shape it with the leadership of God, to take a garden and expand it. That's what God put man in the garden for. You do that starting with you. If you won't prune, cooperate with God in pruning and bringing under control the wildlife inside of you, 
then you're really not going to be qualified to help him prune and control anything else. This is the reason that he takes people that in faith just try to do it right now. It's, it's weak. It is so weak. It's, it seems like a waste of time. It seems like a waste of money. It'd be foolish. Like you have to persevere. You don't want to waver in it. But if you're willing to just say, I got to change, and this is the only thing I know to do to change is to look at who you are, Jesus, and tell you I want to be like you and to try and bring myself under your control, he's like, I will make you a leader in this forever. It will work. I will give it to you. It's not you that's doing the changing. It's me. I'm just looking for a heart open to believe you need to change. And if you really believe it, you'll spend all your time trying to change. And the only way that you can change an agreement with the Bible is asking for it. That means prayer. But don't for a second think that coming here and playing music up here or praying as a leader there means anything if you're not trying to change. If you're just coming and trying to fill roles, you are wasting your time. You're, you're actually, you're, you're increasing your judgment because you should have known. So you want to come here intending to change. You want to become selfless. You want to become generous. You want to become reliable and patient and trustworthy. You want to keep your promises. You want to promise things that cost you. Like you want to actually keep your word at your own cost. All these things. This is what we come here together to do. Doing church is very costly if you do it in a way that you're not a consumer. But the American church loves to put on a show, get you to come, give your money, and then the pastor gets the living. You get to feel clean. It's all a sham. Nobody's actually changing. Nobody's actually becoming in the government of Jesus. You have to come here to die. Like That's why we're coming here. You pray to die. You worship and sing. It's a sacrifice of praise, not an opportunity to look great on stage. It's a sacrifice of prayer, a sacrifice of praise. Okay, so all the writers in the New Testament believed in public to music sanctification called the Tabernacle of David. All the writers of the New Testament. I'm not talking about the Old Testament. I'm talking about the New Testament. I just want to read these last three passages that we're going to end for tonight. I'd skip that on purpose, yes. So let's read James 5, 13 to 20. And I, this is this is the passage 13 to 20, but I took out some pieces for the sake of the length of my notes. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So singing. James is talking about singing right here. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He's literally talking about public confession of where you need help and public prayer for where you need help. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and, con and cover a multitude of sins. It's literally on you. If you see somebody being a hypocrite, a liar, you're like, you can't do that. That's what's happening with you. If they leave, that's okay. You don't want to be in the congregation of hypocrites and liars, but you don't want to be in the congregation of hypocrites and liars. And if that's you, you want to know all of us are hypocritical. That's like, none of us do the thing we, that we claim to want to do. That's a great opportunity to say, God, I need to change. All of us lie. Like all of us lie to some degree or another. All of us are greedy to some degree or another. All of us are afraid to some degree or another. We have to be a people willing to hear that. David, he was willing to hear that. Like people told David, David, you literally had Uzziah killed. You cheated with his wife. Like, and David repented. He said, you're right, I did. Like we have to be a people that speak the truth to one another in love so we can mature into the head. That's what Jesus does for us. Oh, let's read Ephesians 5, 19 to 21. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, hang on. Vince, will you mind speaking to me in a spiritual song? You don't have to really right now. What would that look like? Yeah. A song. That's what it says. Spiritual songs. You'd sing me a song, right? By the Spirit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Very good. So this is practical. He's, he's not like being poetic. He's saying this is how church works. This is what you do. You come together and do this. Singing and making melody. Oh, is this still me? Yeah. <laughs> Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. This is all he's describing church. He's actually telling the Ephesian church how to operate as a church. Like you should experience all these things. You should be speaking to one another, not just singing, not just singing songs. Like we're supposed to prophesy to music, to each other. 
And then we're supposed to make melody in our own hearts. We're supposed to give thanks and praise. And we're supposed to submit to one another in the fear of God. That's that antiphonal, that prophetic antiphony. We're actually supposed to be doing this in a flow of government, of order. That's what David did. So David, what he did was he internally tapped into the government of God. And that government started to change what was going on in here. It started to bring him under control and submission. And because he told other people about that in truth and in love, it started to spread in Israel got so caught up in this that even to this day, if you went and you, you know, just surveyed 20 or 30 people that knew anything about the Torah in Israel, you'd be like, what are you guys waiting for? They'd be like, David, we're waiting for David. David fixed Israel. The way he fixed it was this way. We should be actually fixing Kalamazoo this way, but we barely believe it. We really do. Even us, we bear, be honest, we barely believe this will work. That's the point of the judgment. It's to get us to believe it fully. Okay. Let's read um, Colossians 3, 12 to 16. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Put on Jesus, I could say. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the band of perfect the bond of perfection and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay. Abe, you want to come back up? This is new Testament church. The tabernacle of David is literally just new Testament church. It's what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to actually be participants in church. People that encourage one another prophetically, sing to one another prophetically, repent of things publicly, to song. Why? Well, because we care about other people having a freedom to do that, to not waver, to not feel silly. Like when you actually participate in what God is doing, you make a way for other people to participate. But if you're all alone, this is what we see, the attack of the enemy over and over again in the Bible. This is the spirit of Jezebel. There's like a thousand different ways to say it. It's to isolate people who hear God and see God and make them feel all alone so that they will waver and quit. That's what Hebrews 11 is describing is faithful people don't do that. Noah, in his generation was found faithful. He believed something from heaven. He built a boat as proof that anybody could hear God that wanted to. And he saved his entire family and he condemned an entire generation. This is what God's calling us to, to go in boldly. It's weird, but you don't have to be feel weird. You're not by yourself. You actually been given something most people that have ever inhabited planet Earth have never been given, which is a group of crazy people that are willing to do it together. I mean, you've been given so much. It's crazy what you've been given and what I've been given. Even a couple of people willing to stand with you in the validity of doing this is a massive gift from heaven that most of the billions of people that have ever lived on this planet never even knew about. How much more will he hold us accountable to do it? Stand with me. I just feel like he wants to give us strength strength to not waver. If you want that, if you just need strength to not waver, well, then you're in a great place because that's what we all need. We're supposed to be weak. We're never supposed to finish this by ourselves. We were never supposed to be the ones that God found. He's like, you guys are the strong ones. You'll run the race. We were always supposed to be the ones that there wasn't, wasn't a snowball's chance that we would finish without a miracle. If that's you, if you need a miracle to keep going, he's going to give it to you. If you're just willing to tell him, I need a miracle to keep going. I need a miracle to grow. In this room, Holy Spirit, where our hearts are open before you, strengthen us in our inner men with might to finish this race. Strengthen us. Give us boldness. If we're afraid to come in, to just use our imagination to see you, strengthen us, God, to try it. Just to try it. It would be a complete waste of your life to never try it. Holy Spirit, touch us with boldness, with courage to believe in faith the things of the Spirit, the things that that great cloud of witnesses sees, Lord, that they believe to, even to the point of death. Will you fill us, God, with faith? Fill this room with faith this, this evening. Fill us with courage. Strengthen us, God, in our inner men. Pour out fire. I just see angels all over this room with bowls of fire, things you've prayed for. You prayed for it yourself. And they say, I'm willing to pour it out if you just open your heart, if you just believe for it. God, I want fire. Just tell them, I want fire. 
I want zeal for your house, God. I want zeal for your house. Will you stir us, Lord, in love? We're not alone. This is the way it's supposed to go. In Jesus' name, amen.